Welcome to our, I guess this is our first uh, research conference for the, the new school year. We um, have a great speaker here from D.C. Uh, Patricia McTaggart is, is um, a lead research scientist from George Washington University where she instructs graduate students in health information technology policy, quality, and state health policy. Patricia has been a public servant for almost 30 years serving as in the Minnesota Medicaid Director, Director of Performance Medicaid, and Senior Advisor Medicare for HICFA and CMS. She provides technical assistance to states and federal agencies regarding health information technology, quality, and Medicaid CHIP for all aspects of health, including long-term care, payment, and service del de delivery. She is a member of NEHC, AHIMA Foundation, HIMS NCA boards, and serves on public policy advisory committees for EHI, March of Dimes, MARCO, HIE, uh, KHIM, and is on the ONC Consumer Engagement and Employment Task Force. Wow. <laughs> I have an eclectic background. So she is here to tell us about health information, insurance exchange. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about all of the pieces. Excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, you can tell kind of by my, my background that I dabble in a lot of different pieces, but the pieces all fit together. And I did a presentation at the AHIMA uh, for the leadership and the education that one of your uh, peers saw and asked if I would come speak to you guys. Uh, the way I want to do the presentation, though, is if you hit a slide and I say something that doesn't make sense to you, stop me and ask me. Or if there's something that's interest, let's talk about it. We don't need to do presentation and then questions and answers. Uh, because we're going to hit a lot of different things. And basically, it falls into three things. One, the environment nationally and locally is changing around you, um, and how some of the things that are changing around you that affect both what you can do research on and opportunities to do research. The other piece is you've got a lot going on locally um, to try and talk a little bit about some of those things so you can at least hear an outsider's perspective on some of the cool things that are going on in Oregon, and you can ask me about that. And last but not least, but, and probably just as important, is a little bit of uh, my perspective on how your real life is changing. Uh, that we have moved from a world of, of real grants, and if you have a really great idea, somebody can fund it. And I don't think that's true anymore. I think we're in a contract world. I think we're in a world where unless you provide value to them, it, it's kind of what I've said all along to even my grad students. If so, you have to take a look at what's out there and figure out if there's a piece in it that's of interest to you and then try and reframe what you want to do in context of what they want to get done. Because if you don't, um, you're not going to be able to sell what you want to do. So the changes that impact your policy and your leadership role, um, to talk about that just from a little bit. And I am a wanderer, so if I wander too much, you can bring me back for doing it. One is the environment. Um, we really, as I said, are transforming healthcare, and those transformations in healthcare are changing the demands for healthcare administration and healthcare service delivery. As those transform, they're dependent on and create the need for more health information technology. And all of those create the demand for more analytics and use of data. This is not about health information technology for the sake of health information technology. Nobody really cares about that. Um, I was actually at a meeting uh, last week here where the guy said, I don't want to build the car, I just want to drive it. So they don't want to know about the technology. They want to know about the informatics and they want to know that there's actionable information that will come from valid data that they can use and as close to real time as absolutely possible. So that whole environment is changing um, the demands on you and on the industry as well and how we really try and be more effective and more efficient. It also changes how we are seen as researchers. Um, I think researchers now have a responsibility to do things much more real time, which is really a frustration for researchers uh, because people want answers yesterday. And the idea that um, I used to do 1115 waivers, both with the federal government and as Medicaid, and you guys have an 1115 waiver. The concept was originally I would uh, authorize you as a federal government, you would do something for five years, you would have some good things and some bad things, but at the end of the five years, you would then do a great big evaluation and tell me why it was successful or not. Right now, uh, six months into it, they want to know you the incremental successes, what's working, what's not working. People can't be at risk for five years, the consumers and the constituents. So the whole idea of 
being able to do incremental kinds of answers is absolutely critical. And knowing the questions that need to be answered initially, day one, the questions that need to be answered along the way, and the questions that need to be answered at the end. And it kind of falls into, um, I talk about it in the world of managed care. Before I do a contract with you, I need to know the quality standards that you at least have the potential. If you don't have a network, I'm not contracting with you because there's no way you can serve my clientele. But that doesn't guarantee you're actually going to serve them. So then I do process measures that basically say, are you at least doing the things I would expect you to do that would lead to the potential good outcomes? And that's kind of what you do on the interim. And then at the end, we really want to care if people got healthy. So those are the outcome measures. But nobody's going to wait for us to do the outcomes of any research project right now without being able to answer something in between. Uh, people are also looking to you to bring that validity and that credibility. You have the expertise in informatics in ways nobody has. Most people have been scared of it their entire lives. They thought of it as technical. And there aren't enough of you. So the good news is there's full employment because there are so few and such a huge demand. But as a result of that, you've got to be able to translate what you're thinking and doing into an environment that doesn't, I don't want to say they don't have a clue, but it's not their world. So even the terminology ends up being a very big difference. Um, informatics, I've heard people say, don't tell me, what is an informatics? It's, it's kind of like we now have new CMOs, clinical medical officers. We used to have CIOs in hospitals. Everybody kind of knew what a CIO is, right? Does everybody know what a CMO is? Hospitals decided the CIOs didn't really know about healthcare delivery. So they wanted a clinical perspective, a medical perspective. So they created a new position that is now a CMO, which is a clinical uh, medical officer, but it's a CIO with a medical hat. It's, it's blending those two for doing it. My point in that is the positions are changing, the terminology are changing, and the need to be very clear is, could never be understated. You know, we used to say government has too many acronyms. IT has too many acronyms. And neither world uses the same acronyms the same way. So being very clear and being able to lead and provide that expertise is really another change. And a focus, um, a focus can't be on research about what we have today, because the only thing we agree on is that nobody likes the way it works today. Um, and if you think about research, by the time your research is done, we will have changed the environment at least once, if not twice. So how do you evolve the research so you're researching to where the ball is going, you know, that joke about where the hockey puck is going to hit the hockey puck. Um, not where I'm starting from, but where it's going to land. That's what people want you to be focusing on. Um, it still means you have to know day one things, but think about that. If you've got a three-year project in Oregon, you will have moved from the Medicaid program and its traditional managed care to a whole coordinated care organization model that is more of a service delivery system that integrates housing and social services, things that were not even assumed to be a part of healthcare. Uh, now, if it affects healthcare, it's healthcare. Um, those two things are changing. At the same time, they're going to integrate the private market. And at the same time, we, you have just gone live with your health insurance marketplace, which we called two months ago the health insurance exchange. It's now the health insurance marketplace. So even the terminology is changing as we go um, for doing it. So. If you want to be relevant, it's not analyzing what's going on now, except how it's transforming the world that we're living in, because it won't be around anyway um, for doing it. What makes this double hard is while you're doing this, we're going to do continual changes. Um, my favorite one is everybody knows ICD-10 is going in play, right? Everybody knows what ICD-10 is, right? Um, you're one of the few groups that that can actually be a bunch of yeses for doing it. It will change all the claims data for doing it. So being able to take that into account is something you are aware of. But the people that ask you the questions that are going to, even some of the funders, have no idea of the impact on that. So you have to be that leadership role of explaining that. And then being very external. It's what others need of us rather than what we need of others. Um, there is not enough money. Uh, being in DC right now with everything closed down, I can guarantee you there's no money. Um, and how that affects your current grants um, is also true. But the one methodology and, I would say, message that has been coming out of the federal government for a very long time is that they have to have accountability and they can't do grants anymore. Even if they call them a grant, they're not really a grant. They're a contract for something they need done. Any questions or comments about anything so far? Reaction? Yeah.
We work for a few of the federal agencies, and some of them do issue specific contracts, and sometimes um, more often it's grants. Are you suggesting that many of the federal agencies will move to contracts? There's a big push to make federal agencies move to contracts. Um, even if it's called a grant, that's why I said even if it's called a grant, it will feel like, look like more. In my mind, and this is a terminology thing, and a lot of grants it was you had a great idea, and I gave you a grant, and you could kind of figure it out, even ARC. Uh, basically, they would give you a grant because you sold them on an idea. And you would figure it out and come back with results. And all they were really interested in was the results and the timetable for doing it. Not anymore. Their contract managers, I call them contract managers, their grant managers are now being trained and required to say, what are you getting incrementally um, for doing it? It's not about what they have the best idea. We're putting frames. Take a look at what they are now. They're putting frames about, it's not open and generic. It's how am I going to answer this question? And are you interested in helping me answer this question? So again, it may be grants, it may be contracts, but it still feels like a contract. Um, and foundations, you know, there used to be Robert Johnson Foundations, I'm just picking on them, I don't mean to, that you got a grant uh, multi-million dollars for five years. A lot of those five-year ones got uh, notices at three years and two years that they've changed their priorities and that they're done, you've got notice and they're moving on to the new issue of the day because the issues that were five years ago are not the issues of today. So in the world of healthcare, uh, this is my newest grandson, don't we all do that for doing it? But it's really what's most important about healthcare, it's the most personal thing that we can deal with. So if you think about healthcare, it really is about building the systems transformed around consumer-centric. We've talked consumer-centric for a very long time. Now we have to kind of walk the walk and make it consumer-centric. And really, if you're going to do that, there's three things that can be looked at. It's the population, the services that are going to be provided, and what you're going to pay for them, and how you're going to deliver them. There are really only those variables um, for doing it. But the question is, where they play in relationship to each other? Because the pot of money doesn't get any bigger and you have to figure out how the things are working. So when the issue is, how do you actually deal with those three variables? And the real transformation that's going on in healthcare right now is taking a look at all three components, not just one. Uh, the world of just dealing with hospitals is gone. It is a world about service delivery to the consumer. And if you start at the left, what people are dealing with right now is a very evolving policy. While you're doing your research, we're gonna change the policy on top of it. But policy is just a concept. If you don't have the infrastructure and the service delivery system in order to implement it in play, and they know what they're supposed to do, which means we're changing workflow. As you, move, as you know, as we move to a, the world of electronic health, it's not about just the use of a health information technology to get rid of paper. It's changing and creating efficiencies, and that creates differences in workflow. And that workflow has multiple implications. And all of those things are happening simultaneously. So being able to do a cause and effect, just quite frankly, is going to be near impossible to do anymore because four variables are changing at once. And then, as all of those things, we're trying to put what was really the financial and quality impact of any decision for doing it. And what you're going to see in the year of 2014, it is probably the biggest year. If you think back uh, a couple years, we changed three major pieces of federal legislation in less than two years. We do major pieces of federal legislation in healthcare about once every two years, but we did three in less than two years. They are all being implemented as we speak. So it's not just about health information exchanges. It is not just about health insurance exchanges. It's about Medicaid eligibility changes. It's about payment reform. All of the variables all happening at once with the consumer in the middle and people's expectation that it's not talk, but it's real walk um, for doing it. And every time we move one, we change all the rest for doing it. So it is, uh, it is not sequential, it's simultaneous. Um, this is really my definition. It is the dependency on actionable information, which is dependent on accurate data uh, at the appropriate time, which is dependent on adequate health IT. From the outside world, they don't even want to know about the back. They just want the transformation and they want the actionable information. What we care about is making the first, the bottom pieces be accurate so you can do the top pieces for doing it. Easier said than done. So my main message to you is you have to think about tomorrow care, not yesteryear care, uh, which 
is a new terminology, but it, even today care is yesterday care um, for doing it because we are moving away from it. This is another one of, I love my grandson in the middle, but this is a variation on a, a, actually an organ picture uh, for doing it, which is really talking about uh, state innovation models because simultaneously to the health insurance exchanges, one of the things that is going on in Oregon and some other states are SIM grants. You guys know what state innovative grants are, that your state has one? Uh, like 40 million plus dollars, the federal dollars, to do um, a transformation on the service delivery of healthcare in the state of Oregon. Your health insurance exchange is adding to populations. Your Medicaid expansion is adding Medicaid populations. And you're building a health information exchange structure simultaneous to this, which has a whole new initiative going around. But while you're doing this, you've also got a grant, uh, called a grant, but it's really a contract, with the federal government to move to a coordinated care organization. So does everybody know what your coordinated court care organizations are? You guys know. So they're regional based, and they're like the old managed care plans, except they're not, because they are consumer centric and they actually have local community, the hospital, the clinics. If you think of the, um, the old ways of looking at an HMO, the insurance company contracted with a network. In the new model, the network contracts with an administrative arm. So it's kind of flipped for doing it. And it also changed another piece. Not only is it regional and local based, it changed the definition of healthcare, that it really is anything that impacts health is in, although you've kind of held long-term care out to the side um, because you do that differently for doing it. But the point of doing this is in order to do this transformation, there are certain goals that nationwide people are doing, but clearly you're trying to do here. The triple aim, you guys know that, better health, lower cost, better care. Um, that's the one everybody talks about. But in order to do that, we are really looking at alternative payment models. We're looking at uh, accountability, a care coordination, performance reporting, huge piece of being able to do accountability, and innovative service delivery models. In order to do that, it is data and information dependent. Um, we are going from structures where, unlike Kaiser, where everybody works in one organization, to virtual teams. Virtual care coordinated teams of players that didn't even used to talk to each other. Behavioral health with uh, physical health. Dental is a part of the physical health. In order to do that, you have the middle uh, circle, which is really the HIT foundation. It is that information highway. You can call it lots of things, but it's the infrastructure to make the data flow. It has to be there. It's, but health information technology is not just clinical information. It's an enrollment and eligibility. It's a member portal. It's identity management. It is um, analytics, which is huge. And it's registries and repositories. I think there's a tendency in the world right now to talk about electronic health records. Everybody's clear about electronic health records, right? Do you guys think there's a difference between electronic medical record and electronic health record? Yes. I like that some are saying yes. Are there some of you that are a little confused? Because if you talk to vendors, it's really hard. They use the terms. Um, here's the big message in the world of meaningful use. You guys know what meaningful use is, right? Meaningful use is money to hospitals and providers for the use, the meaningful use of electronic health records. It is called an electronic health record because an electronic medical record communicates within the facility. Electronic health record has to go between facilities, provider and hospital, hospitals and hospitals. It is not a cell within the system for doing it. Um, and that's what the money is for because the care team, the care team in a hospital clearly needs to work together, but they've got systems to do that. It's a care team of the, to avoid readmits into the hospital. You, you don't avoid readmits by the hospital doing it. They can only take it so far to make it sure you're not discharged too soon, that you've got really discharge planning, and that there's a good transition of care, which is a lot of emphasis right now about transitions of care. But if there's nobody to transition to, or that information doesn't go to somebody, or they don't do anything with it, the hospital gets dinged on the hospital readmits. So this real need for all the players all of a sudden has changed because of financial incentives to really have all those players. And you can't do that by paper. You can't do that by fax, and you certainly can't do it by people. Uh, in the old days, if we did a referral, we would uh, call somebody we would know and stick it in Federal Express or maybe fax it. Trouble with faxes, you don't really know if anybody ever picked it up and if they picked it up, if the right person picked it up. Now think of electronic, and you guys know this in the, in the world of informatics, that it's an electronic mailbox is what it is. But it's getting people to go to their electronic mailbox and to use the data and have it consumable. 
because uh, none of us like a bunch of PDFs. Uh, we have, can't really do anything with a PDF. We can read it, but we can't really utilize it. So if you think of your role and what the world of health information technology is, you can't do the outside without you being on the inside. But the outside folks don't want to worry about you. They want you to be like, I want my computer. When I open it up or my iPad, I just want it to work. I want it to get me there. I don't want to worry about what you know portals that I have to go to. I Google and it gets me where I need to go. Um, that's what they want from the outside world as well. Um, the other thing that is happening that we also need to be conscious of because it's going to affect your world is as we transform payment reform, all of those data sources that you used to have, well, good news, there's going to be some data sources you didn't have before, but some of those that you've depended on go away. Um, and that makes it harder. Uh, we have new terminology. I talked a little bit about that. Um, my favorite one is only Congress would, in one year, pass two pieces of legislation that both have HIEs in them and not even understand that they did it. But we have solved that temporarily. Um, think about that. We had two HIEs. Their solution was to make one health information exchange an HIE and health insurance exchange an HIX. Clearly, that didn't work for people because they were still too close to looking the same. So they decided to make it health insurance marketplace, which is totally confusing people because they don't know how that fits to the exchange since we've lost that. But um, my point is acronyms are changing, terms are changing. You're just going to have to be really clear in what they are. But they all become new data sources for you. We didn't have a health insurance exchange before. So we didn't have data on the uninsured we did because they were uninsured. We now have data because they're going to be insured. Think about operating a health insurance exchange. In order to operate that, they have to have demographics. They have to have race and ethnicity. They have to have your insurance. They need to know what qualified health plan you've chosen. They need to know your family um, because it's a family coverage policy for doing that. And they have to know everything that I need to know for Medicaid because it has to be a simplified application. Guarantees consistency because it's one application or one standardized way of data elements standardized definitions, standardized times of collecting, um, standardized processes for processing them, all new opportunities that you can now bring in for looking at something across populations, across payer sources. So that's the good news. Um, and they also connect to the feds, which is, creates a whole new set of things for doing it. Uh, that created a, a new populations, like the uninsured now became insured, and new service delivery models. Um, the whole tax credit, uh, capability means that we're going to have more information uh, that is more internal revenue based. Now there's all kinds of restrictions and requirements on IRS data that the health insurance exchanges have to follow. But it is again a new data sources because in order to operate, those health insurance exchanges are trying to connect to workman's comp. They're connecting to unemployment. Those data sources were never connected before. They were all isolated. So the opportunity over the next few years because of what they're creating for operations create a new opportunity for things for evaluation and for ongoing uh, looking at things. The other thing that's changing is not only is Oregon getting CCOs, I can't find a state who's not trying to follow the Oregon model, and it is really a cool model, so you guys should take great pride in this. But it's also an unknown. The, the good news of being the leader is you're the leader. The bad news of being the leader, nobody's done it before you, so there is no right answer. You can't do a comparison that say, were they successful by the old standards? Because your whole goal was not to meet the old standards. So how do you set the standards and the bars for what you're evaluating? Um, and think about Oregon's just such a great place to look at because you've got the Medicaid moving to its CCOs. Its state employees are eventually going to go to that. But you've also got the health insurance exchanges that are creating qualified health plans. Not the same, uh, not the same requirements, and maybe not the same network, and maybe not the same players. There's some overlap, but not totally for doing it. And a qualified health plan, not a term we used more than two years ago. Um, and in Medicaid, we don't talk about a gold, platinum, silver, and I've got them in the wrong order, it comes up later, levels. But in the new world of health insurance exchanges, those are different levels of plans, and there's different parameters about each one of those. So understanding the variation, you know, once you understand what each bucket is, you can figure out how to relate the buckets to each other. But there is no consistency between the buckets, so it, it makes it an interesting time. At the same time, you have a huge initiative, and have had one, on health homes, uh, which is another way of looking at it in, in kind of the traditional fee-for-service market. 
uh, rather than a full managed care plan, of creating a health home for people who are chronic illness. Chronic illness also including people with serious and persistent mental illness and substance abuse issues as well, which we tr haven't traditionally thought of them as having a health home. But again, if you remember, we've redefined health. So it, it totally makes sense. But as a result of that, you have, again, a bunch of new entities. Their payment methodologies are very different. Um, in some of these models, the idea of a claim does not exist. So if your data source has always been for the financial aspects or even utilization was a claim, over the years, your data source is going away. Think prenatal care, uh, both private market and Medicaid. Uh, years ago, we paid for every visit and the hospital stay, and we could count on how many prenatal, what prenatal care you actually got. Um, it wasn't that many years ago, maybe six to eight years ago, we decided that the better way to pay for prenatal care was in a global budget. Uh, bundle payment is the way we called it. And the idea was that if you made the doctors at risk for the delivery, they would incentivize, I would be incentivized to get you to come in, and that I would look at the quality of what you were getting and identify things earlier. Because that would mean I wouldn't have to do a C-section and that I could do uh, an easier delivery and have less cost in the hospital. Which is exactly what we want from a policy perspective. But I no longer know if you had one visit or 14 visits because I don't have episodes of care. Which is why moving to the new world of electronic health records, we're getting clinical data on what actually happens in the clinic, in the hospital, becomes our new data source. Which means your role becomes even more important because it actually is looking at real clinical data. It's not looking at claims data. Does not mean that claims data totally goes away or that it doesn't play an important role because you also have an all-payer claims database here, uh, which has a lot of historical data. And you're not going to have electronic health records aren't going to go back to my birth. Uh, I, there's no doctor out there that would do that. Uh, maybe if I, my grandchild that's nine months old, yeah, he's been on electronic health record from day one because I wouldn't let his parents go to a doctor that did not have electronic health records. Yeah, not going to a hospital that doesn't have those things. But that's my bias going into that. So he will have one his entire life cycle. None of us are going to have one for our entire life cycles because they weren't existing. Uh, and some of those of you that may have been involved with Kaiser over the years probably have more of a one than others. But outside of that, it, it doesn't exist. So claims data is never going away as a piece of the information. But it's no longer going to be the information. And then um, the other is new benefits. Um, and this is my favorite one. Even Medicaid didn't pay for habilitative, except in home and community-based waivers for individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, it is now a new core benefit. It still needs to be defined. It still needs to do it. But it's going to be in the private market. It's going to be in the public market. And so there are things like that. Uh, just my example is that's an easy one because it didn't exist. But other things like care that impacts health. What does that mean? And what gets covered? And again, as we do these different payment models, the incentive is to do that. Uh, there's a whole debate going on scope of work on if a, uh, it's between dentists and dental hygienists for years, on what could dental hygienists do versus what can a dentist do for doing it. Those discussions are coming up in a lot of areas. Uh, telehealth is going to be another interesting area that people are starting to look at because we used to think of that as our issue for the rural area. It is now a very urban area issue because telehealth with new electronics, um, the leapfrog group, guys know who the leapfrog groups are? Private? Yeah. Okay, so one of their three priorities were intensivists, which is uh, that we have a specialist like a hospitalist in the ICUs because of the specialty of the care that's doing there. Um, even in very urban areas, each hospital in, in a lot of places can't afford an intensivist. So what they have set up is a, an intensivist in one of three hospitals with all the technology built around them that they are, in a sense, in the ICU in more than one hospital at a time. So that's bringing telehealth to the very urban center in some ways that we, it's not a consult in the way of doing it. Telemedicine is kind of what we used to think about. Think about telehealth now in the new environment where we're really talking about technology doing the home monitoring. Because it is not a consult. It is about, um, I go to my computer system in the morning and I hook up and I do my blood pressure, you know, it hooks up and it runs all the data. Nobody interfaces with me. It runs all the data and it runs to, hopefully you're my doctor, it runs to you or a designated place. That's a whole policy debate. Talk about a policy question. Uh, is a, a durable, 
is the home monitoring equipment durable medical equipment that we treat like a, a wheelchair? Or is it a physician service? Because it's not a value unless a physician or a nurse actually reads it and reads it well. But the idea of that telehealth in that case is not person to person consultant. It's person to machine and machine to machine. So we've even redefined what telehealth is all about um, and looking at it very differently. Um, my point is those are, um, I don't, can't obviously do numbers very well, but the point is all those variables are changing. And they're great opportunities to look at things from a policy perspective very differently. But they also make it harder to do an evaluation on them because they, people want to know on the accountability, you know, were there program integrity issues? Were there quality issues? Were there financial issues? Um, think about the way we normally do program integrity. Does anybody work in the world of program integrity? We tend to look for the deviant that if all of the people on this side of the room saw 10 people a day, and all of a sudden you showed up with 30, I'd go, yeah, right. That doesn't look right. I need to look at that, right? The data would tell me 30 is a deviant. OK, look at all the variables I changed. 30 might be the right answer, and none of you are going to have the same number to start out with because we're in a transition. So how do you do program integrity oversight in an environment when we don't really know what the right answer is? And what we do know is probably the answer we have today isn't the exact right answer. Um, so looking for that deviant isn't going to work. Um, so it's a good question for somebody to answer. You can find a contract if you want to do that one. Um, this is actually Oregon's picture, because um, I want to bring it back home for you guys, of thinking future, but how many things are changing. This is just their health information exchange, and it's a draft. They have a whole set of work group that I've been meeting with uh, that is trying to deal with concretely. Conceptually, we all want something different. What does it take to do that? When do we do that? How do we do that? What's OK? What risk are we really willing to take? And if you start with today, um, there is some technology that's in place. You guys do direct secure messaging. You guys know what direct secure messaging? Anybody? And um, that environment allows exchange of information. Now, between hospitals and doctors, there's a whole debate between with the electronic health record having even uh, effects capability within it, is there an advantage to go to a secure electronic exchange? I would still argue yes, but there is a debate about that. But in the world of healthcare delivery, it's not just about physicians and hospitals. It's about physicians being able to talk to the nursing home, the hospital talking to the nursing home to transition them out into the nursing home care from the hospital. It is about the hospital talking to the home health. They're not going to have the formalized electronic health records right away. So the direct secure messaging is a tool to communicate securely and privately with those entities that need to be part of the healthcare system, but they aren't going to have the full-blown electronic health records, at least not in the near future. And you guys have a tool that does that. Um, you also got to figure out who's going to make the decisions, because we're creating these new entities. There wasn't a health information exchange before because it didn't exist. There were regional health information exchanges because they didn't exist. There weren't health insurance exchanges. Every state has to figure out what that new entity is and when and how you regulate it. It's kind of like moving to the world of HMOs and managed care. When they didn't exist, they weren't regulated. But the second they started to be, there's consumer uh, needs and security and privacy and just care that you don't want entities operating with the state that are not regulated by anybody. I mean, if something bad could happen. So part of the debate right now in every state, including yours, is to figure out if there is an infrastructure to create the highway, what is that highway? What does it look like? What does the state provide uh, to its constituents? What do providers provide? What do uh, other entities provide? And how do the, the uh, pieces fit together? And if you I think you guys have it, but in DC, they, they reference the beltway around the DC. And everybody gets on it for different reasons. But you have the on-ramps. Ramp, um, so think of you as a provider. Uh, you want the on-ramp to get on to the highway. And sometimes you're going to go on public transportation. Sometimes you're going to drive your own car. And sometimes you're going to go visit family. And sometimes you're going to go to the doctor's office. You don't want to have different on-ramps that I go to A if I'm going on a vacation, and I go to B if I'm going to the doctor. It's one on-ramp. And that's the highway that you're trying to build for the world of information that creates the data that can be done for analytics on the back end, but also creates the ability to deliver care much more effectively and efficiently. So you guys are at this first stage. What you're talking about right now, and so is every state, 
which is what are you doing in the next two years? You know, what are the pain points with all the things going on that have to be in place to be able to transform the healthcare delivery, to do that outer circle that was on the big one? And your priority are some foundational things. Uh, provider directories. Um, think about in the world of electronic. I know, because I would get it from you, I may know your phone number, I may know your mailbox address for snail mail. That's how we communicated, or your fax number. If we're going to do things electronic, I need to know your electronic address. And I certainly don't want to have to call you or get a hold of you and get your address and get a hold of your. And as a hospital, they certainly don't want to ask every physician for theirs. But there has to be a way to collect those new e-addresses as well, I'll call them, for doing it. So you can communicate with each other. You want to be able to do referrals back and forth, but you don't want the provider to have to figure out and call somebody up and say, okay, I need to send a referral to you, you know, what's your e-address. So the state is looking about the tools that you would need. And just like you need a phone book, you, in the new world, you need an e-phone book. Um, but it's an uh, electronic address kinds of things. And then uh, patient index. Biggest national public policy issue. Um, if it ever gets sorted out, I'll be a happy camper. For some reason, we think it's not okay to have an identity about us, although we all have social security numbers. But that aside, we don't want a patient ID. However, if you really think about it, because healthcare is clinical, there is a Patricia McTaggart in Iowa. I've never met her, but she is diabetic. I am not diabetic, but we are the same age and have the same name. I do not want her clinical records mixed up with mine. And I don't go to Iowa very often, but you know, I travel everywhere, so odds are I will be in Iowa in the next couple of years for some reason. That's where it takes a bigger, different change. It's, it's one thing to worry about it in non-clinical, not direct personal things. But when you get to that level and you get to the emergency room, I want them to know everything they can possibly know about me as quickly as possible because I want to come out alive, right? So the fact that when I was young, I went by Patty, don't ask me why, uh, and then I was Trish, then I was Trisha, and now I'm Patricia. Um, I would bet the emergency room at the time that I went into it has whatever variation I was at the time, including my pre-married name. So I want the ability to bring that together. What we have tended to say right now is there's at least five to seven variables we put together, and that says we're the same person. Uh, that's a lot of work, and it's hard, and we're crosswalking it all the time. We're spending thousands of millions of dollars with vendors crosswalking it every time we do things. So the big national policy debate is how do you deal with consumers' fear of big brother and the ability to get to an identifier that helps us in a clinical healthcare perspective to make it easy to get the right information on the right time. And um, the state also is trying to sort that out for Oregon. Um, because quite frankly, the five elements that people usually say, if, if you've ever worked with a Hmong population, it doesn't work. Uh, because especially if they've come over from Vietnam, um, a lot of the families have multiple wives. It's not legal in the United States. So they all picked, um, well, at least in Minnesota, they all picked uh, January 1st as their birth date. They have five people with the same name. Um, they didn't have a birth date, so they picked the same birth date. Um, they don't have Social Security numbers. So all the variables in certain populations that we traditionally say would make me stand out from you, uh, except for sex, don't work in those populations. So we, we've kind of hit the point that it was OK for eligibility to, to take that risk. But when we're talking about do we give them insulin or not, it, it takes it to a whole thing. So that's clearly a message we're doing that. And then creating the highway um, for doing it. Hospitals, uh, particularly uh, those in, in this area, but I would say everywhere, uh, are talking about the need for notifications and alerts. Um, this is the idea that if I'm a primary care doctor and you're in the emergency room, the only way we're going to get you better care and follow up is to have an alert that uh, they've had an ER visit. Um, it also is the ability for ER to have more data about you. So those are, are kind of high priority things for people. Uh, because we have to do accountability, clinical quality metrics is the accountability metrics. Did you improve health care? So a lot of discussion about creating a state clinical quality registry. And then I really give you guys credits for this one, technical assistance providers. Uh, I don't hear that in a lot of other states, and it's critical. Uh, what we know in Florida, and I'm not picking on Florida, it's just where the data is from, uh, the Business Coalition of Health, you guys heard of them? They are a private coordinator, it's kind of like the LeapFrog group, that has been working on a quality thing for a very long time. They were working with their doctors, and I, I'm back a few years for doing this, but they really started looking at quality data, and the doctor said, your data's wrong. 
So they started feeding it back to them and then started to do an analysis. And doctors all think, not unfairly, that they are in the 98th percentile. They wouldn't be doing it if they didn't believe they were in the 98th percentile. What the data showed is they were in the 98th percentile with the actions they were doing today based on the day they went through residency. Because when are you most intense in this? When is it most strained? And, but unfortunately, if you're 62 years old, you weren't in residency last year. Well, you might have been, but most people were not for doing it. So the physician's perception was correct. They were doing the scope of practice at the 98th percentile or the 100th percentile of what they were supposed to be doing. Unfortunately, we keep changing medicine and everything and don't keep it up to them. So getting that information flow, giving them the best tools so they can use them, means that's an opportunity to improve health care. But it has to work for them. Um, IT is not about creating the IT system and getting everybody to adjust to it. It's a creating the IT system that has the workflow needs. That said, you cannot create IT to meet a paper world, paper world or we haven't changed health care delivery. Um, just because we did it a certain way for workflow because we had to follow the paper. Um, and I don't know if you guys know the story, but it's my favorite one for CPOE. There was a big article on uh, Massachusetts Hospital where they actually had showed they had more medical errors after they put in CPOE. Did you read the rest of the story of how they implemented it? The doctors didn't like implementing it, so the doctors circumvented it and hand wrote the orders and gave them to the nurses who took them to the front desk and then put it in the CPOE system. Do you kind of think it kind of def kind of messed up the purpose? So all the things they were supposed to fix, like handwriting, didn't get fixed. So implementation is a critical piece and, and piece people are looking at it. And then you guys are talking about you know 2015 because what do we know about IT? Anything you start today will barely be in place by 2015. So uh, it's again thinking ahead. And if you're going to try and do any analysis in Oregon, did I not say your world's changing when you're going to try and do it? All of these factors will be in place and 20 other things I haven't figured. And health insurance exchanges um, for doing it. And there's variation of ways of doing it. I have to tell you, Minnesota, I am from Minnesota, is still got the favorite commercials that I have. I, the Paul Bunyan ones, I think, are a stitch um, for doing it. But that's just because I'm from Minnesota and I like Paul Bunyan. Uh, but you got Care Oregon. You guys are operating the state insurance exchanges. There are other states that are doing a federal partnership and other states where the feds are doing it itself. There is not a state where there's not a health insurance exchange. By definition, they all went live this week. Some ha there is also when you implement anything, there is always glitches. If you think this was bad, there's no way you could have predicted this. Uh, but I said this with Medicare Part D. Who would implement something for elderly and disabled on a holiday that was a Sunday? That's when we implemented Medicare Part D. Think about that. Pharmac when do you get your pharmaceuticals when you're an elderly? On the first of the month. So they went to a new program to go into a pharmacy on a holiday to try and get something that they never had before that the pharmacists were also trying to transfer. The only thing that outdoes that is putting a government shutdown on the day that you're trying to implement a health insurance exchange. <laughs> you know, I, I said they couldn't outdo it, and I was wrong. Tell you why I shouldn't predict anything, right? Uh, but even in a state that says it's not in our state, it's in our state. And because it is your insurance, it affects every provider in the state. Because it is in your state and it has to have that single application with the Medicaid, it affects all the Medicaid and the state programs. So it doesn't matter if you have a federal one in your state or a state-run state. Um, it is in the state, and it has to integrate with the health care delivery system, and it has to integrate with the other insurance coverage systems in the state. The partnership ones are just really interesting. I won't spend much time on it because it's not you guys, but it's really intriguing. There were states that got really smart and said, you know, Oregon figured out a long time ago and said, we're going to do this, so they started working on it. Other states kind of dug their head in the sands or spent a lot of time thinking about it and then said, I want to do it. Well, what did I say about IT? There's nothing you can do that quickly. You cannot six months ago decide you want to have a health insurance exchange. It ain't going to happen. But what they, the federal government did with them is we will partner. And what the states did is those things that were most close to them. Regulate the qualified health plans. They regulate health plans all the time, something very close to their hearts, and consumer uh, engagement kinds of activities, something that, again, is very local, navigators and things like that. So the uh, plan management and the consumer assistance in those states, and they all have plans to have more state takeover 
of the operation of the health insurance exchange, but in a, a plan that where they can get to it in a way that they can effectively get it done and have the infrastructure in place for doing it. Questions about the health insurance exchanges? And you can look at every paper everywhere on what's going on with that one. Um, and it also, new options, and this is the part I think is important in the service delivery, because we now have to figure out how we oversight them and how we do them. There is teleimaging, there is uh, texting. It's also starting to look at the telephone and using those things different, the traditional file sharing through the internet, remote health monitoring, uh, video conferencing in the world of behavioral health, Skype blogs, uh, email, secure ones hopefully. And here are the new data systems, um, that new opportunities for data sources um, for doing it. And in the first column, it is the clinical data sources that we didn't have before. Second column are more the uh, claims. Third are surveys and administrative data, uh, CAP surveys. Uh, you guys have CAMI, you have other things like that. Um, you're also going to do some for your CCOs. Administrative data, we can't forget, that's a huge piece of information, like I said, in the health insurance exchanges. And the whole world of public health data. These now, because of the health information exchanges in states, will be connected. Before, trying to get data from those across was just impossible because they were all silos. Now, over the next couple of years, they will be able to be connected through various variations uh, with each other and allow data to flow. The other thing that's happening is all these new tools are being overlaid that are the analytics, that, uh, um, the ability to do data warehouses, to provider portals, consumer portals, um, provider directory. But all those tools lay on top that allow you to take the data out. So it's the ability to collect the data, to ingest the data, to analyze the data, and to disseminate the data. And then the dissemination, there are all kinds of new outputs that are coming out. And the real difference is where is it going to? It is now about feeding it back to providers at the same time we feed it to regulators as we time. And the whole world of consumer engagement is we also feed it back to consumers uh, so they can be an engaged party to this. My point of this slide, and I know it looks busy, is we have to start thinking bigger. We've thought about a data source, and right now a data source is not what we're about. It is about information that is collected from multiple sources, how they're put together, how they're analyzed, and then how they're used um, to serve the person. And so what's changed, what not, the uh, funding models have changed. We talked about the contracts. The reason to engage, um, people are looking to you as the experts. And so you need to be a part of the engagement. Uh, we have a huge need and a gap that needs to be filled, and it needs to be filled by you guys. Um, and there's more than enough work if you're willing to do it. And the benefit from engaging. Um, there is not only, and I say this to my grad students a lot, but it's true, and I think we forget this. By leading in the research, we gain knowledge. Um, and gaining that knowledge and being able to apply it is something that you're very good at. And that is something that is being really, really missed. And that's where the contracts and the grants are really being um, requested is that translation and that utilization. And um, the more you're seen as that credible leader, the more you'll be able to lead. And I, I think you get to use this time to really maximize that and, and fully utilize that and um, bring your expertise to the table. And let's see. I don't know that I would do much on this. Data sources, we talked about that. Uh, think differently about data collection, data content. Uh, we get a lot of new data sources. We're going to have to be very clear about which ones align, which ones don't, how old, what's a uh, source of truth for dates and things like that. And then the IT infrastructure and the specifications to do that. Those are all needed in order to do what we just talked about doing it. Um, they're pretty boring and they're pretty basic, but they are the critical pieces for moving forward. And then format, interfaces, and then governance. And I talked about the source of truth. But it's really understanding also some of the limitations of the data and the opportunities as we move forward. And this one has really become a hot issue uh, for pre and post. There is a lot of data now that's outside of the claims data that we haven't collected. And now the expectation is that we have that inside our information. And uh, that's a new one for somebody to figure out how to make that one work because it's really going to be difficult. And then as I said, we've created the health insurance exchanges that didn't define anything the same way as anybody else. Challenges uh, for you and for everybody else is interoperability, a word I didn't say three years ago, and now I say probably every two hours. Um, and that means the ability to not only send data and get it back, but to be able to be understood the same way going as it does coming. 
uh, the fact that structured data is only 20% of the healthcare data. So uh, how do you really analyze non-structured data? Privacy will always be a big issue. In order to have privacy, you've got to deal with security. And then, quite frankly, keeping up with the change of pace because it's going to keep changing. And welcome to healthcare. It never gets better. Oops. Sit those down. And um, these are just all the different things that are going on at once to uh, Jason McNamara is a friend of mine at CMS. Those are all the things he identified that will change why you're trying to do anything that will affect your data sources. And public health has become a new part of this. And how states are going to deal with that is going to be critical for you and for everybody. Because that's a piece that has been outside the market and is now inside the market. And an expectation that we have the data. One of the things that CDC put out um, literally on October 2nd, is a notice to all state public health. They have the systems to identify and do alerts. They are closed down. So states are going to have to pick that up while we have the furlough. State infrastructures, because of those kinds of things, because of Sandy and all the kinds of, of issues that we've had in the last couple of years, natural and man-made, the, the role of states in the data is going to be important because it's got to be a part of the healthcare delivery system. It's not the reporting. It is service delivery. And cost, you know, money is always a big issue um, for doing it. And this is just my favorite way to end, what to avoid too much information and too little knowledge. Because we're going to have a lot of data, potentially, hopefully, a lot of information. But if we can't change it into knowledge, it doesn't do anybody any good. And I try to rush the end to give us a few minutes to ask questions since nobody was asking in the process for doing it. And yeah, I am from Minnesota and I do talk fast. <laughs> Hopefully we hit on a few things that were of interest to people. Any comments or questions? Just a reminder that I forgot. Use the button when you ask your question or make a comment. Could we talk about a national patient identifier just for a minute? And I know it's taboo talking about that within the federal government, but I had heard there was a private sector effort to work on that, and I, I wondered if you could give us an update on what might be happening. Um, actually, it's taboo. The federal Congress actually said to HHS that you cannot spend any money or spend any time on anything that goes near this subject. Much to my surprise, the FACA group, you guys know what a FACA group is? They are a federal advisory committee. Has For ONC, Office of National Coordinator, which is HHS, has now taken up the issue of a single identifier because it came from everybody. Uh, and I was a part of the group that was doing the national effort, all the organizations to do it. And our proposal to Congress was, let's get an IOM study to tell ONC that they have to do it. Now, how silly is that? But that was the only way we could figure out of getting it done, since HHS said, doesn't matter if we agree with you totally, we can't touch it uh, for doing it. But they have, at least their legal advisors are, are taking a very liberal view of uh, a FACA group could do that, and that's not really HHS spending more money on it. I'm not sure how they're making that work, but um, I think the question is how we do it, because there's nobody anymore who says we shouldn't be doing it. But there is a consumer advocacy group, and there's a lady who's on the Hill every day, and it's her mantra. It's her full-time job. The, the, this is about big government. This is about big brother. Um, you know, California had trouble with the immunization registry for years because the perception was it was a tipping point. If you let them have an identifier there, which they needed in order to do the immunization registry, it would just be a snowball. And it would just keep going. So I think we are in a position where the clinical need outweighs the perceived concerns of the past. Uh, but it's a tough road uphill. And with this Congress getting their attention right now on that, probably won't be high. But I, I will tell you within DC, that's how we get some things done, is get IOM to do a study that will say everything you, you already know. But somehow if they say it, it makes it legit and moves. I was just going to kind of piggyback on that. Um, is there any talk about standardizations across platforms? Yes, and with the Office of National Coordinators, the CMS does the standardization for quality metrics and for meaningful use incentive payments. But the Office of the National Coordinator is the home for uh, standardizations for electronic health records. They're now talking about standardization for health information exchange, uh, that they set the standards for doing it. 
This is the balancing act. Um, I, am, I have a bias here, and I will tell you that. I believe standardization is more efficient and more effective, and, and it's like driving the car. I don't really care what the signs look like. Just make sure I understand what the signs are, and hopefully most of the time I will comply with them. Just give me enough notice. So, you know, in Maryland, uh, seatbelts in the back seats when October 1st they notified the world. I have no excuse for not knowing that. But I don't think that's something we should bury. I, I think that is a standard that we do it. And I think the information highway is the same thing. I think it is, it's like Microsoft. There's nothing worse than switching between Microsoft and Apple because you're going through two different standards. That is true in the healthcare world. And we have enough confusion, we don't need to add to it. And we want this to be easy for providers. And they will be better off with standards. But the real debate um, is, is really a triangle. And I love this one. It's not mine. It's actually somebody here came up with it, which is what do you centralize, what do you standardize, and what do you align? If you think in that kind of model, what you centralize are the things that are the regulations, that they are statewide for doing. What you standardize is it doesn't matter if provider A or provider B are doing it. These are the standards. It's like an ICD-10. It makes our life, we may hate transferring from an ICD-9 to ICD-10, but we all get why there's a value of doing ICD-10. In the world of electronic, that is just, to me, core. And aligning is how you implement it. You, want, you may want some ability that uh, dentists don't have to put everything in that a doctor does because they don't do the same thing. But where they put it in and how they, the formats of what they put it in and what it means, you want to be the state. So that's where standardization aligns for doing it. Um, to me, it's core. It is very hard in a market that wants to balance marketplace and local initiatives with state and federal determination. It's just a hard one. Providers also have a little concern about what they call cookbook medicine. Um, but that's not what we're talking about. We're not telling them how to do it. We're trying to create standardized tools that can do it. Because one thing that we have found already is alert fatigue. You know, if your phone beeps all the time, you just turn it off, right? There is a certain point at which you do that. The trouble with alerts is that um, if I'm in your office and I'm starting to have a cardiac, and I'm diabetic, you do, I do not want you doing my foot exam and doing those things. But you, the alerts will do that if they are not prioritized in the hierarchy to them. If I'm a diabetic and I'm in the doctor's office, if he doesn't check, looking at him, but, or she doesn't check, it's going to hit an alert before I try to go out. But if the overriding reason I'm in there is it looks like I'm having a heart attack, I don't really care about my diabetic care right then. And neither does the doctor. So we've got to... The trouble with the industry is the IT industry is also evolving. And we've almost built this expectation that they're here, you know, kind of that chart of, of where they're going. We are at meaningful use stage one today. Does everybody understand stage one? There are certain requirements, but it doesn't even require the electronic exchange of information. It requires testing. It doesn't require exchange. That's meaningful use stage two, 2014. Only if you're a hospital is this now 2014 because they're on fiscal year. But for everybody else, that's January, like the rest of us for doing it. So even those standards that the vendors had to build to don't go in place. And all your vendors are rolling them out as we speak right now, uh, sadly. Uh, it's turning out to be summer and fall when they're, by the time they got the information of what they had to do, they created it, they're implementing it. I don't know where OSHU is, but it, it, you, your hospital must be putting in its new meaningful use to, or maybe it has it in right now, I don't know. But it would be now that it would be doing it. Um, so part of it is that new technology wasn't there. And what do we also know about, did anybody get the new Microsoft that didn't work? The trouble with new technology is sometimes if you're the first one doing it, it don't work. And uh, my husband is one of those that the second it's on the shelf, he's got it. I'm one of those, if it's on the shelf in six months, then I'll go buy it. Because then it, it's probably working and somebody else tried it. That's where doctors are. Think about small physicians. They don't want to try anything that's, you, I, my favorite question I get from them, and they call and say, tell me which one to get. You know, I'm not going to go ask for it twice. So that's the problem we're in for doing it. And I'm over time, so I'm going to shut up. Thank you. Thank you.